There it is. Okay. We still mark. I like mark. You know, we haven't done a year. We haven't done a year's worth of mark yet. We're only to session 46. So, you know, at least you can complain if we get to a year. Took them hundreds of years to write the Bible, and you're upset. Well, it, it, you know, it's, it's kind of like the documents we have at work. You know, they're over 2,000 pages long. I said the Bible's 2,000 pages, and it's still fighting over it after well, 2,000 years, right? Well, read Obamacare, 3,000 pages. How many pages? That's right, you know? Some of them were even read. What's that? Obamacare. Oh, they read every other page. Uh, O-U-S-I-N. O Teradosin, Teradomai. Uh, this is the word, I wanted to repeat this word uh, because Peridoma is the one that we've seen that, that's translated like three or four different ways. And I kind of wanted to refocus on that a little bit. That's cool. Um, these two words, <coughs> I, I feel so happy because I finally got the word, other word. And so I can't let it go. This is anastemi. Anastemi is... If you look in your Bible, you'll find anastatai, which is the, what we'll find in Mark if you're looking through it in your um, interlinear. But anastemi is the base word, which means to rise up, stand up, literally to stand up, um, which is, we use anastemi ek nekros, or anastemi uh, in Mark, anastemi ek thantos, rise from death. And, and, and usually this word, egirio, E-G-I-R-O-M-A-I, egiromai, <coughs> egirio, egirio means to rise up in the marketplace. And so in the other Gospels, we find, in go other Gospels in Paul, we find the statement, egirio ek necros, rise from the dead, rise up in the marketplace from the dead. <coughs> And in Mark, we see anastemi. And I don't remember if there's any, I don't think there's any Pauline letters or other letters that use any other um, Greek sayings. Because remember, there is no Greek word for resurrection. There is no word in any language for resurrection until basically the Latin, <coughs> until Latin, and we start getting into Latin, and they invented a word for resurrection. Uh, and you might ask yourself this question. I think I asked it before. <coughs> I love this idea question. Remember, how do they how does Greek form words? Oh, yeah, the suffix prefix, remember? Like and this is the thing that you hated about the um, the SAT ACT, right? Remember when they did the AC does anybody remember when they did the ACT SAT? I remember. I remember. I remember taking it in a cold, dark high school uh, auditorium someplace in the middle of Tacoma, Washington that I had to find and drive to myself. You know. Um, when you when you studied for that, what did you study? Greek prefix and suffix, right, and forms of words, because that's the that way the Greeks the made the words. <laughs> what's, what's that? So that explains a lot. Oh, that's, <laughs> oh, so, so you're, you're studying something else. Oh no. Okay, okay. It, it came too late for Dave, but all right, for the rest of you, this is great. So, so, you know, we re-get it, right? In our old age, we have to re-look at this because I make you go through all these prefixes and suffixes. But, you know, if, if you were Greek, if, if you were Paul, or you were the disciples, what would you have done if you were Greek? What would you do if you're Greek and you need a word for resurrection? Yeah, you combine existing words. But what did they not do? Make new one. They didn't make a new word. They used a they used a prepositional phrase. Well, think about that for a second. You know, let let's say let's say let's just say I made it all up. Okay. Let's just say I made it all up. Right about Jesus and the whole nine yards. Well, if you're going to make it up, what would you do? Make up a word while you're at it. Let's make up a word, right? I mean, you know, I keep telling you that Strong's and Vines gets it wrong. Strong's and Vines tells us all the time that all these all these words were invented by the what? The church and the followers of Christ, and they all specifically mean things. Like, for example, pisteo, pistis, 
you know, baptismo, right? We'll see the word baptismo today. When you see these words, usually, you know, in the Strongs and Vines, they'll make, because they have 2,000 years, well, not quite 2,000 years, but, you know, 2,000 years of, of antecedent <coughs> of, of thinking about it, right? Just like us. We have too many years of thinking about this Jesus thing. And so, in that intervening period, we have invented all kinds of neat ideas, right? In our minds. And we even put it, it kind of flies it. So the Strong's and Vines will tell you that, uh, for example, Logos. Logos means the divine word, right? But we know that Lego and Logos means a logical argument, see? It's very simple, because it's Greek. So if you're going to invent it, well, let's invent a word, too. Why, why would we just sit there and go, well, why would we use a prepositional phrase when good Greek always invents new words and puts them together? And by the way, there's a whole Socratic argument, which I'm not going to go through the whole Socratic argument. There's a whole Socratic argument that you can read. Um, which one is it? Phaedo? Is it Phaedo? I think it's Phaedo. Where in the Phaedo, and if you read my book, The Second Mission, you can see pieces of Phaedo because I translated it for you. But if you read the Phaedo, you'll see the argument is about the Greek language and the fact that everybody else is a barbarian because they don't speak Greek. Because why? Because the Greek language is always precise and logical. Socrates argues, Socrates argues, of course, written down by Plato. I believe it's in the Phaedo, but you have to check it. it I believe it's Phaedo. But in Phaedo, he argues that the words of Greek are the original language of humankind because they were always logical and they always put them together. Anna Stimmy. Para de doma. So he argued because of the way their language was built, you could always, you, in his mind, and this is the way I teach, because this is the way the Greeks in the ancient world thought, they believed that you could take apart a word and always figure out what it meant. So God spoke Greek. Jesus. Jesus spoke Greek, isn't it interesting? And God decided that the New Testament should be in Greek. in the fullness of time. And by the way, remember, although people, okay, you got to remember, they'll always argue against it. But remember, I've talked about the Council of Jamnia in 100 A.D. In the Council of Jamnia, the Jewish leaders supposedly decided that what would they exclude from their documents, the Old Testament documents. Not the Septuagint, but rather all documents that they believed originated in Greek. So they only chose documents they believed originated in Hebrew. And guess what? They were wrong. They picked some of the wrong documents. They didn't understand. And by the way, I believe they picked the wrong, wrong set of Esther. I think the Esther they picked was the Esther that was written for the... Uh, the Babylonians. They picked the Babylonian that was expurgated. They pulled the God stuff out. And that the Greek version, which we have the extent, I don't I think there was a Hebrew version probably of Esther, but the Greek version is wonderfully full of God stuff. Isn't that interesting? Anyway, so the point is this. You know, when people say, you know, about like the, the brown guy, right? I want to continue to give you evidence, you know. When people bring these things up about, you know, for example, Brown, why that Brown guy who wrote the Da Vinci Code, I mean, it's amazing that he's a, you know, his and books. And What's that? Demons and angels, the other one. I don't know. I read, yes. I don't know. Uh, it just, yeah. he's nuts. He has no clue what, what he's talking about. This stuff, if, to me, is so story, obvious. Though. What's that? Good story, if you like science fiction. If you like science fiction. Unfortunately, it's, it's not story. classified as science fiction. Love it. In any case, we are still looking at Mark, and we are in Mark chapter 10, and we're in 1032. So, they were in, they were in the Keen Hodos to Jerusalem. That's what it says in Mark. They were, they, they were in, it's not on. Somebody missed the preposition on that. It's not the on preposition. It is the in preposition. So they are in 
the teen hodos up to Jerusalem. And up to Jerusalem means, remember I showed you a map, and I'm going to give you a map tomorrow or next week because of where they're going. But remember I gave you that map and I showed you they were here at the um, uh, Tiberias, and this is the Sea of Galilee. And the Sea of Galilee, and I showed you in the map, they moved down this way, the Jordan, down the Jordan River, and in the Jordan River there is Beit Anya, um, Bethany, Bethany on the Jordan River, where, by the way, John the Baptist was baptizing. And right next to it is Jericho. And so to get to Jerusalem, you have to go up to Jerusalem. And so when they say going up to Jerusalem, it, it, it means they are going from Jericho. Or they are going up from the Jordan River, which you know they are, because that's what they said they were going. That's where they were going to. I gave you some charts last time, or a few, uh, couple of times ago. So, in any case, go, you always go up to Jerusalem. And Jerusalem's on a hill. Um, and figurative also. The saying is going up to Jerusalem is usually used from going from Jericho. There, the other way to get to Jerusalem, and if you read my book, the Centurion, if you read Centurion then you know that the centurion, when they approached it, they approached it down the, the road. Because there is a road that goes to the plains, which, by the way, passes Golgotha. And that's where the, the, uh, the uh, uh, Romans crucified the guys. Because there is a road that's outside that's in a plain. Uh, Jerusalem, um, I, I used to be able to draw the picture of the city just you know for a peanut. But now I'm not as good. Um, the city kind of looks like this at, the, at that time. And there is a gate here. The, one of the main gates to the city is here. It goes out into a plain. And the tombs in Golgotha are over here. And there is a major road that goes up through the mountains here. And that's the mountain path road. That's the road that uh, sometimes you'll hear it called um, the road of uh, the, the pilgrim road. The Pilgrim Road. And the Pilgrim Road was very unsafe until the Romans made it safe. The Romans kept the Pilgrim Road pretty safe. So therefore, when Abinadar, in my book, they go with a Roman guard, they go down the Pilgrim Road. And the other road is to go up from the Jordan. And usually this is pretty safe because the, Roman, the Romans kept um, a cohort in near, not in Jericho, but across the, the river. So it was a pretty safe place. I was just rereading some of Centurion, so I, I have some really neat details in there that I'd forgotten. Cool stuff. And there was also a cohort in Jerusalem. So anyway. They offer doing reruns. I love that. Well, I, you know, when, when you study something for four years and you write it down in a book and then you don't reread it for a while, you, you lose all the, you know, there's tiny details that are really cool things that you read about in history. And then, you know, if you don't review them, you just forget them. You so, never get through Harry Potter, would you? I, I'm not very historical there. Anyway, Jesus, Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were stupefied. You remember why they were stupefied? They were stupefied because the previous Lego, the previous logical argument was that who can go to heaven? Only people who don't have... Stuff. Yeah. Things, yeah. So if you don't have things, you can go to heaven. Not rich people. That's not what it says at all. Mark says if you have things, you can't go to heaven. So they're still stupefied. And we're going to see why they're stupefied, because this is really interesting. They And those who followed were afraid. Now the disciples are stupefied, and people that are following are afraid. What are they afraid about? What is the big deal here? Who does everybody think Jesus is? He'll be a king. Be the king. Yeah. He's the, he is the king. He's the Christus. And so the people are following. They're following him, but they're afraid. Because if, you, if he's going to go to Jerusalem, he's going to be what? Declared the king. And if he's declared the king, what's the Romans going to do? Crush him. Crush him. And not just the Romans. The Sanhedrin will probably jump on that pile, and so with the, you know, the priests, and et cetera, et cetera. Everybody's going to jump on Jesus. And they're like, huh. Now the disciples are stupefied. And we're going to find out even more why they're stupefied. We know because of the previous logos, but we're going to find out even more. So in any case, 
He took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. Okay? So, we are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man, now remember, we don't know who the Son of Man is. This is an unstated telos. Will be betrayed. Peridodomai. Literally, peridodomai means to surrender. So, this, this means to surrender, but it is translated here, uh, he'll be uh, betrayed. But it doesn't mean betrayed, it means surrender. Surrender yourself, basically. To the chief priests and the teachers of the law. Literally, the uh, uh, not the teachers of the law, it is the uh, grammateus, to the grammateus. Um, they will condemn, Caracuna will judge him to death, the thantos, and will hand him paradidomai. So the same word, paradidomai, is used twice and translated two ways. To hand him over, and also translated to betray. But it means to surrender over to the ethnos. And the ethnos is, ethnos means, and I gave you that as a word of the day, I'm not going to go into great detail where we talked about that, but it's a racial group or a cultural group. Cultural group is probably better than racial group. So basically the ethnos would be the Romans and the Greeks. So, who will, in 34, who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him? Three days later he will anastimi. So it said he will, this is basically, here's your prepositional phrase, anastimi ek necros, or ek bentos. So from death. He will rise up from the dead. Um, and this, by the way, 34 is a direct, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A direct uh, uh, quote from the Septuagint, from Isaiah 56. 56, and also from Hosea 6.2. Um, let me see. I want to read. I think this is short enough. Yeah. Uh, 50. It's a, a very short. 50 says, this is what the Lord says. And I want you to listen to this very carefully. Because remember, what was the previous, what was the Legos before the Legos of stuff? What stuff was the most important stuff that Jesus talked about stuff? Do you remember? What was the most important stuff that you could have, according to Jesus? Be it was the one before. It was no, no. It's the one before this. Do you remember what that stuff was? Who's going to kingdom? Those that are pure. Who are children? Children. Children. Remember, first we had the thing about children because children, exactly, they are pure. Therefore, they can see the kingdom of heaven, right? And you need to be like a child. It's a paradox. And then he talked about where children come from. Marriage. Marriage. Because, you know, we, we're missing the point, but the whole point is about stuff. It's about stuff. Because children are stuff. You know, in our culture, we, we believe the government owns children today, but in the past, they believe that you, that parents, own the children that the parents protected and kept the children. I know ownership is not a popular term in the modern era, but that's true, right? You kept them because they were your, not just your stuff, but your body, right? Your blood. And who else was your stuff? Your wife and husband were your stuff, right? And this is one of the reasons when Jesus pounds Peter, because Peter says, we've left everything for you, right? But he hadn't. Because there's another piece of stuff that's yours is what? And Jesus talks about it. If you're not willing to lose your life. So your stuff, and then he goes into the big stuff stuff, the big things, right? Children, marriage, life, stuff. But look what it says in Isaiah. This is what the Lord says. Where is your mother's certificate of divorce with which I sent her away? Or to which of my creditors did I sell you? Because of your sins, you were sold. Because of your transgressions, your mother was sent away. When I came, why was there no one? When I called, why was there no one to answer? Was my arm too short to ransom you? Do I lack the strength to rescue you? By a mere rebuke, I dry up the sea. I turn rivers into a desert. Their fish rot for lack of water and die of thirst. I clothe the sky with darkness and make sackcloth its covering. The sovereign Lord, Lord Yahweh, 
has given me an instructive, an instructed tongue to know the word that sustains weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being taught, like a talmud, like a disciple. The sovereign Lord has opened my ears, and I have not been rebellious. Mary Jesus says, he who has ears to hear, listen. I have not drawn back. I offered my back to those who beat me. This is six. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore have I set my face like flint, and I know I will not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who then will bring charges against me? Let us face each other. Who is my accuser? Let him confront me. It is the sovereign Lord Yahweh who helps me. Who is he that will condemn me? They will all wear out like a garment. The moths will eat them up. Who among you fears, and notice, they will wear out like a garment. The moths will eat them up. If you remember back, like chapter 3, do you remember the marriage? And about the marriage accoutrements? And you can't put old cloth to patch new, right? Remember that? This is the sovereign Lord who helps me to see. Who among you fears the Lord, 10, and obeys the word of his servant? Let him who walks in the dark, who has no light, trust in the name of the Lord of Yahweh, and rely on his God. But now all who light fires and provide yourselves with flaming torches, go walk in the light of your fires and the torches you have set ablaze. This is what you shall receive from my hand. You will lie down in torment. I'm just saying, doesn't this passage in Isaiah almost exactly parallel what Mark is... In? You know, if you notice, all of these passages that we've looked at in the Old Testament, the Psalms, etc., we're going to see more. Which one was this, Isaiah? This is Isaiah 50. 50. Isaiah 50. Yeah, I'm just telling you, when people read Mark, or had read Mark read to them, Remember, it was recited because it was read to them. What did they immediately conjure in their minds when they heard this? Um, Who will mock him and spit him and flag him and kill him? Three years later he'll rise. They pictured exactly what I read to you. And all this parallels precisely the arguments that were being made. Well, let's see. There's, there's even more because this is really interesting what happens here. In 35, then James Johns, the son of Zebedee, came to him. You notice they say, teacher, not rabbi, teacher, did a scout. Teacher, they said, they lego, they lego. We want you to do for us whatever we ask. Remember, what, why did they say, we want you to do for us whatever we ask? He just said, anything you ask my name will be given to you. That's right. He just told them. See, this, you know, we missed this point. This stuff is all cohesive. It's not picked out. It's all one narrative fit, okay? It's a logos to tell us, logical argument to enunciate to tell us. So they ask, we want you to do whatever we ask, because Jesus told them, whatever you ask, you'll be given, right? What do you want me to do for you? Can, can you imagine Jesus saying this? I, I would love to put it, you know, okay, what do you want me to do for you? You know, I, I, I just see this, I, I love Jesus is, you know, we read it and we, get, we miss all this fun stuff. They reply, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your doxa, in your glory, doxa. What word, remember, we talked about this when we talked about Romans. The word doxa is very important to Romans. Romans, yes. To the Greeks, it's kadis. To the Hebrews, it's shalom. shalom. It's uh, arena, shalom, peace. But... <coughs> To the Romans, it's doxa, because doxa means honor and glory. So, can we sit on your right and left? Now, there's a real problem with this. What is the problem with sitting on the right and left? What does that mean? Does anybody get what that means? I mean, this is a cultural thing. We don't think about this anymore, ever. But what does it mean when you're on the right and left? It will be your first officer. It was, it was power, and they were like, going to be advisors to the king. Not just advisors. When someone is on your left, they are your your, your advisor. When they are on your right, they are your shield bearer. Okay. 
Your shield bearer in Greek culture is what to you? <coughs> First officer. Mm -hmm. He's equal. He's your shield bearer. He is your, he is your, in, in our culture, we view, okay, even though we are a Bida culture, we are a Bida culture. Bida culture means that we came from a culture, the Anglo-Saxon culture and the German culture, by the way, and most of the Northern European cultures are Bida cultures. In a Bida culture, you have your shield brother, and your shield brother is not, une he is equal to you. Your life in his hands. And your life is in, you share, you share everything. And sometimes I got out of hand, but that's okay. The Greeks also were a Bida culture. The Romans were not so much a Bida culture, but they had some of those characteristics. In a Bida culture, if someone is on your right and your left, that means they are claiming to be equal to you. So therefore, they wanted to be <coughs> rulers. Now, well, rulers, you see, what did they not get yet? He's God. Right. The, he's telling them he's God, and he's going to go get beat up and killed, right, and raised from the dead. And what are they still thinking? He's going to be king. He's going to be king. And, we, you know, if, if they had any inkling in their mind that he's going to die, right, and, and what the Greek author is telling us is what? They believe he's going to go in there and kick booty. He's going to kick the Romans out. He's going to kick the Greeks out. You know, he's going to kick the aqueducts out. He's going to kick all that, you know, all the cultural progress out. They're going to go back to whatever, right? That's what that's what they believe. Or they wouldn't say this stuff. You know, I was getting down on Peter, and I'm still down on Peter. But you see, I told you before that I didn't think that any of the disciples got it. Do you think any of the disciples have got it? Now look what Jesus replied, because Jesus replied many times confuses us, but if you look at it within the perspective that we've been talking about stuff and things, look what he says. Well, well, just a second, one's on your right hand, the other's on your left. Well, one has got to be lower than the other, right? <laughs> just brought it up. I know, but you know, it's, Jesus got to make a choice here, right? Which one of these guys is going to be on the right and left, right? But look what Jesus says. Sometimes we do not want to take Jesus at his, uh, you know, Jesus is going to tell us in Greek, right out. Look what he says. You don't know what you're asking. Now, many times we want to obfuscate this. To We, we believe, right, that the disciples think that they're going to go to heaven, right, and be part of the kingdom of heaven and be on Jesus' right and left, and they're going to be like gods, right? I don't think the disciples have a clue, and that's why Jesus makes a statement. You do not know what you are asking. Because if, if they had been asking to be on Jesus' right and left in the kingdom, would Jesus have said, you don't know what you're asking? No! He would have said, you can't do it, right? But he said, you do not know what you are asking. Very direct. In other words, they think that it's not heaven. It's earthly kingdom. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with a baptism I will be baptized with? Pretty straightforward, you know. And they're still thinking in a martial sense. We can, they answered. And Jesus echoed to them. He's echoing. He's not logos, echoing. You will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with a baptism I baptize with. Remember what he told what did he tell John, or tell Peter? He told Peter, you will have a hundred times more, but you will have what? Torment! Just like in the Old Testament. The stuff will torment you. In other words, your responsibilities will torment you. This isn't a happiness here. We can. And you will be baptized and drink the baptism I'm baptized with. In 40. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. Actually, he could grant it, couldn't he? Why can't he? You have the picture? Here's your century, and here's the centurion, and here's the optio. 
We'll see why. But the point is, Jesus, you, you can only have one leader, right? One God. In other words, what would happen if God, if God granted an equality? He couldn't be God. Because God is omnipotent, singular, singular, right? You can't have lots of gods. Well, maybe there are. See, I, I, in the world of their world, they believe there are lots of gods. But to have a God equivalent to the supreme God is what? It's an impossibility. So when Jesus says, I can't grant it, it's because God can't grant the place of another God. Can't happen. It's, you know, for those who are theologically minded, this is a really interesting theological point. You know, something worth theologically looking at at some point. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. In other words, and by the way, okay, those for whom they have been prepared, you can play it any way you want. Who has it been prepared for to be in that place? What's that? Jesus and the Holy Spirit. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They are equal three in one. Right? And of course, if you look at C.S. Lewis, they are a three-dimensional projection of a four-dimensional being. Which is a really cool thing, right? In other words, God is a singular being in four dimensions because God lives in time and we don't. And therefore, the projection, okay, a two dimensional projection into one, di in, a three dimensional projection into two dimensions has, is a, is a sing, is a, has multiple dimensions within that dimension. And a four dimensional projection into three dimensions has three projections. Read C.S. Lewis. It's got cool stuff. But anyway, this is science. And so, in other words, who is at the right and left of God? Equal, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Already, it's those who it's, who it's prepared for. They don't get it. This is an unstated tell us. This is like obvious stuff to all the hearers. Um, 41. When the ten heard about this, they became... Agakiteo, greatly afflicted. They were indignant. Indignant's an okay word. Um, why do you think they're mad? A couple guys are trying to get ahead of them. Well, yeah, they didn't ask first. Man, if I thought about that, I would have asked first, right? Even Peter said, oh, man, I should have asked, right? Why did, I, why did I, I ask my other question? I could have asked Jesus to be on his right lap. See? Jesus called them together and Lego. You know that those who are regarded, dokeo, those who think to be, it's not regarded, it's those who dokeo, who think to be rulers of the ethnos, rulers of the cultural, of the culture. And by the way, ethnos, I know they translate it Gentiles, but ethnos means cultural affinity. So the ethnos in this culture are who? The Jews. The Greeks, the Romans, yeah, you could say they're Gentiles generally. I mean, the Jews would say Jews and Gentiles, but there are more, right? Because there's also the Samaritans, right? So rulers of the ethnos, and, and I know they say Gentiles, they want to say Gentiles, but Mark, I don't think Mark's pointing to Gentiles. When he says that Jesus will be handed over to the ethnos, who's he going to be handed over to? Yeah, it, it's not just, see, we want it, uh, for some reason, we want bad guys, good guys, right? And, uh, and unfortunately, everybody's, everybody seems to be a bad guy in the Jesus story, which is pretty sad, because, you know, nobody's coming out here with pink, with roses, right? There's a few people, that one Gentile woman who, who argued with Jesus in a beautiful logos, I think she comes out pretty high, that's pretty good. There's a few people that come out pretty high on the, on the thing, but a lot of them don't. And I think that we, you know, we want to throw this to the Gentiles. Well, it ain't just the Gentiles, it's everybody, right? It's all the ethnos. So anyway, Jesus says, those, you know, those who regard, who think of themselves as rulers of the ethnos, of the Jews, Gentiles, Greeks, whatever, lord it over them. 
and their high officials exercise authority over them. You see, the sons of Zebedee asked to be rulers in Jesus' kingdom, right? And they think the kingdom is going to be an earthly ethnos. And so what does Jesus immediately logically argue? He's, he's talking about a hierarchical political ethnos. Now what's interesting about this is remember Jesus told them before to be like the leaven, not the leaven, the brewing, the beer brewing of the Gentiles and the Jews. Remember that? Way back in the when he was in the boat. In other words, he said to set up their earthly structures to control education and politics. That's what he told them. So they're not too far away. It's just the fact is they're focusing on the political structure of the now, of what they imagine. But Jesus tells them, okay, they lord over them, and their high officials exercise authority. So this is the beginning of the lows. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And the word is diakonos. Deacon, waiter. Wait, deacon means waiter. Deacon does not mean a church official. Deacon means a servant, a waiter. He must be the waiter. In other words, he must be the... Optio. This is why I like this example, the Optio. I think this, especially since the words that are used, like calling Peter, the word used when he sent... He, he didn't rebuke Peter. He said, Optio. Get into your position of not being a leader. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your diaconist, must be your waiter. 44, and whoever wants to be protos, first, must be doulos, a slave of all. Now, this is a paradox, Right? In other words, if you want to have a position of importance, then you got to be a servant and slave. This is why I always worry about people. I, I worry about them everywhere, in churches, in businesses, other places. You know, there's nothing wrong to want to lead. But sometimes we worry about people who want to lead, right? Who, who really, really want to lead. I mean, there's some people that, you know, you know... Okay, okay, I, I'll get up front and I'll, you know, and the people that are running toward the machine guns, that's a goodness, right? If everybody's following, of course, if nobody's following you, you're in bad shape. But, you know, if you're willing to really fight and really do something, a lot of times without anybody knowing it, right? That's kind of this picture of people that are doing the work without any authority, responsibility. This will become even more important as we get further into this. But interesting. Um, for, look what it says in 45. For even the Son of Man. Now, who is the Son of Man? We don't know. It's an unstated telos. We assume it's Jesus, right? But Jesus has never said he's the Son of Man. For even the Son of Man did not come to be saved, to be served, but to serve. And to give his suke. He gave his suke. Ooh, this is really important. Sarks, suke, panuma. Panuma. It doesn't say he came to give his sarks. It says he came to give his suke. What does it mean to give your suke? Your life. Intellect. What does that mean? You subvert your thoughts. In other words, the Son of Man came to put his thoughts where? Under whom? Under God, right? To do what God wanted. And it says, as a ransom, literally a lutron, something to loose with. Uh, something, a lutron, a lutron is, is a ransom. It can be a ransom. But to give his, his thoughts, his mind as a ransom for many, for many. Not his life, but his thoughts, to subjugate his thoughts. Because this is the whole message of Jesus and Paul. How do you do good? By controlling your 
thoughts. You can't. Can you give up your pneuma? No, you can't. Pneuma is what? Pneuma is eternal, right? Infinite and eternal. Can you give up? Can you really give up your suke? According to Greek thought. Can you give up your suke? No. Suke is, is eternal too. Can you give up your sarks? Yeah. So how's the only way you can give up your suke? Well, well, the way you can give up your suke is to put your thoughts under the control of, you know, for example, another person. And Jesus just told us that is there any leadership on earth that we're supposed to put our control on? Or are they, the, let's put it in their terms. So it's not theological. It's totally within the context of the gospel. The disciples, who did Jesus tell them to put their thoughts under? God and him. So it says, um, for many, and it goes on, to see 46. That, that is not the end of this Logos. Okay, that is not the end of this Logos. I mean, it, it, right now we're going to get to Jericho, but this, this is not ending the Logos. Yeah, do you have a question? If I can step back a step. These guys are all Hebrew culture who believes that when you're dead, that's the end. But he's talking about a kingdom that is after that point. They have no concept of a, of a heaven, do they? That's a great question. Because they were pharisaically, probably pharisaically trained, they probably have the idea. Remember, the Pharisees believed in you know, life with God, eternal life. The Sadducees did not. So I think that is a very, very important note or point, because, you know, remember, this is culture, right? This is culture. So even if they did come out of a culture where the Sanhedrin believe, you know, the, the leaders of the Sanhedrin, and the Sanhedrin are the um, uh, Sadducees. That's why they're Sadducees, right? The Sadducees did not believe that people went to God. If anything, they went to Gehenna, right? They went to that place that everyone went when they died. There was no uh, goodness, right, after when you die. But the Pharisees taught that there was, and the Pharisees came out of, remember, the Greek Hellenization. And that's where they got their ideas. We see it building in the apocryphal period. I know we can trace rudiments of it back to the Old Testament, but where you really see it is in the apocryphal period. That's where the Pharisees really got their push because they began to be Hellenized and going, and they went from... The idea, I like to put it in this corner, but anyway, they went from the idea of the Adam, Nefesh. And then when you died, there was nothing left, right? The Nefesh is your breath. The Adam is your, you know, Sarks. Sark, Sarks is kind of both of these together. But the Nefesh was your breath, not from God. It was your breath of life. And the Adam was your physical body, the thing of, made of, the stone, of, of clay. So, you know, they, they were going from this idea that was there was nothing to the, the Greek Hellenized idea. So what did that mean culturally? Can you see what this means culturally? Are they fully accepting the Pharisaic position? No, not totally, right? Because they're like everybody. You know, just think of positions in our own culture, you know, whether they're good or bad, right? Whether moral or unethical. You see some people going one way and some people going the other way and some people don't have a clue. Right? And most of the people don't have a clue. Yeah, 90%. Well, let's do 80-20 because that's uh, the Pareto principle. But at least 80% have no clue, right? And so 80% have no clue. So at least 80% of the disciples, so let's say 10, you know, are ambivalent. You know, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're not. And one of them is pulling the Pharisee way and one of them is pulling the Sadducee way, right? At least. So you can see that in their own minds they're confounded. So when we think culturally, let's not think, um, let's not think that uh, every, it's a plenum, right? It's not a plenum of thought. The people's thoughts are mixed, even within the disciples. And we see that, right? So this is beautiful. In 46, I hope we can get through this because this is beautiful. 46, they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, going up 
on the way, the Tihodos, to Jerusalem, a blind man, Bar Bartimaeus, that is the son of Timaeus, that's what it means, is Bartimaeus means the son of Timaeus, in Greek, by the way, was sitting by the roadside begging. Um, climbing to Jerusalem, there's, there's a large number of people with him, and when he heard it was Jesus, and, and by the way, think about the position of the disciples right now. All right, Jesus told them that if you have stuff, you ain't going to the kingdom of heaven. And the last thing they asked him was, we want more stuff, right? <laughs> okay? They heard it was Jesus of Nazareth. When he heard it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to lego. He didn't shout. He began to lego. Jesus, son of David, eleo, have compassion on me. Now, this is very, very, very different. Hey, Ronald, does it say he was begging? Huh? Does it say he was begging? Yeah. Uh, the word, yeah, it was begging. He was, he was asking, he's blind, he was asking for stuff. Now, what's interesting, I didn't look at the word, at the name, but Timaeus is Greek, and Bartimaeus is Greek. So, this guy appears to be a Hebrew, but he has a Greek name. We've noticed this before, remember? So, anyway, uh, but, but this, what's happening is very different, because what happened before? Who asked? Who asked before? No, for healing. The father of the boy. Well, we ne yeah, we never we now you can go back and look back, but no one has asked this way before. Because before it was either someone else asking, there's an we get the impression that people asked, but in Mark this is pretty much the first time. There are a couple of times when it's close. But we get a, this is really pretty much the first time that someone has asked him. Remember the very first? The guys let down the person that was paralyzed. Remember the, the kid or person that was paralyzed? The, you know, um, Janice, the father of the girl who died, asked him. People asked, right, for others. On behalf of. Now we have a case, and you notice what he says. This is very different because what he says, he let go. Jesus, son of David. What did he just do? Call him out by name. He called him the king. He called him the king. Man, you talk about, you know, people are afraid already, right? He's got this big crowd going with him, and the disciples are shaking, are, 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 disciples are indignant, okay? They're clueless and indignant. They want stuff, and they think Jesus is going to declare himself king, and he's got an army, right? And they're going through Jericho, and the guy who sees him out of Jericho going to Jerusalem, this, by the way, is part of the pilgrimage, big deal pilgrimage, going to Jerusalem, right? He says... Hey, wait a minute. He's yeah. a blind man. He could not see. <laughs> All right. Just, just saying. He knows his <laughs> when he heard, when he heard, <laughs> it was Jesus of Nazareth. And you notice what Mark says. When he heard it was Jesus of Nazareth. Mark does not say when he heard it was Jesus, son of David. Right? Yeah. Well, apparently this guy already knows something about his background, too, so that must be kind of common knowledge that this guy's a descendant of David. Well, Mark is telling us a lot here. Mark is... Mark... Look, I know that we have become so inured to the words. We just read them, Right? But the words really do matter. And look what it says, even in the English. I mean, I, I don't even have to translate it because the words are pretty well translated here. When they heard it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to lego, not shout. He began to lego, make a logical argument. Jesus, son of David. Jesus, the king. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. You know, no, look. Did the disciples ever say Jesus, son of David? No. Did they ever call him the son of man? No. Now, Peter called him Christus only because he wouldn't call him God. But now we got some dumb blind guy who's legoing, legoing. In other words, he's producing a lot. I don't I, I hate the fact that they take the they take the Greek and they turn it into a shout. He ain't shouting. I'm being facetious, because he's pretty smart, don't you think? 
But what did he just do? So does that mean like the synagogue or the people of Jericho were really in tune to what Jesus was doing? I would say that the whole countryside was. Because remember, it says that a huge crowd is with him. So yeah, there, there are lots, and you know, um, you know, we probably get the wrong picture. We see Jesus honk, honking along with his disciples, right? But the picture of Mark shows us is when Jesus is honking along, what's going on? He's got his homies with him. He's got everybody with him. Everybody's following him. You know, he's got all these people. It's like you know, get rid of him. And, you know, a couple of times he does try to get rid of him, right? You know, so he's going through Jericho, he's going through the Jordan Valley, River Valley, and he's picking up people. Probably John's disciples and others. They're all going up to Passover. But, I mean, they're all going. Right? They had to go three times a year at least. They were all going. Well, following the route of Joshua. They, this is a great question. Because when are they going up? Because the impression Mark gives us is they're going with Jesus. The impression is not that this is part of the Pilgrim Festival. But, but we'll see, because I don't think it's part, you know, if it is, it's probably Shakot and not Passover. Because the images we get later are Shakot images, um, uh, festival booths, and not the Passover, not Pinsach. So, you know, this is kind of interesting stuff, because that is a beautiful question. Keep, keep that question in the top of your mind, or keep that idea in the top of your mind, because we should remember that. And let's see if it fits. Because it kind of does and it kind of doesn't. It may or may not. We'll see later on where it may fit. Anyway, um, 48. Many rebuked him. Well, yeah, and told him to be quiet. Why? Because this is the way to get killed, right? Insurrection. This, yeah, it's insurrection. This is pure insurrection. But he shouted. No, he legoed all the more. Son of David. Have mercy on me. He just called, he just said that you are the Jewish king. That's what he's saying. Um, he just called him the king. 49. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to a blind man. Cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. Now, the impression we, we have is the guy is standing up and yelling and shouting, right? No. He's sitting in a spot, he's begging, but he's legoing people. He's arguing with people, a logical argument that Jesus is king. Basically, that's what he's saying. 50, throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came. Why did he throw his cloak aside? Cultural. Why do you throw your cloak aside? You're unarmed. Well, you do not approach a king with armor. That's precisely correct. He's doing, that's, that's a night thing, but in the ancient world, when you approach anyone of a higher, like, you know, a king, or anyone of a higher whatever authority to you, you would take off your cloak and put it down because that showed that you were, number one, un unarmed, and also because it showed respect. Concealed. Care. It's kind of like in the old days, you would, you would, you know, tip your hat, right? You take your hat off. This is, this is the way you do it, and he threw his cloak aside because that's how you were a king. 51, what do you want me to do? Jesus asked him. The blind man, Lego, Rabboni, Rabboni. Remember the disciples? Did a scholar. Hey, yeah, teach him. This guy is one of the few, we've seen a couple times, who called him Rabbi, Rabboni, Rabbi, Jewish teachers. In other words, he just called him well, he just called him a rabbi, a Jewish teacher, right? He called him king, he called him rabbi, Jewish teacher. I want to anablebo. Now, I should probably give you this as a word of the day. He doesn't say, I want to see. He says, I want to look up. Anablebo. If he just said, blebo, blebo, that means I want to see. But he said, Anna. Blebo, which means I want to look up. What does he want to look up at? God. Not just God, but that's good. That, that, that is basically what he's saying. He says, I want to look up at what in Mark, the kingdom of heaven is always pictured as Aranos, the sky. He wants to see what? The 
The kingdom of heaven. Exactly. He wants to see the kingdom of heaven. You know, this this guy is not unsophisticated. He understands the issues. He understands the point. He's just blind. Maybe he says cataracts. I don't know. Um, he calls him rabbi. He calls him the king of the Jews. The disciples are calling him Descala. And he asks, not that he be healed of his blindness, but rather he be healed of what? What does he want to see? He wants to see the kingdom of heaven. Here's the first guy. Nobody else has asked to see the kingdom, have they? Everybody else wants to see what? All the disciples want is a physical kingdom, right? They want their stuff, right? Nobody's asked to see the kingdom of heaven. This guy's asked for something entirely different. Because before, Jesus was taking care of all kinds of needs, right? Whether they're physical, spiritual, whatever. We, you know, that's the implication. He's taking care of their needs. But here's somebody who recognizes they have a spiritual need. And they want to see the kingdom of heaven. And they believe Jesus can show it to them. This guy knows that Jesus is who? Is who? Not only God, he's the son of man, he's the Christus. This guy knows it. 52. Who pago? He doesn't say go, he says who pago. Lead yourself under. Lead yourself under. Said Epo Jesus. Your pistis, your persuasion, you're convinced of a Lego, your persuasion, your persuasion has not healed you, has saved you, suzo you. Immediately he received anablibo. He looked up at heaven and Akkoleo went the same way with Jesus, with the same teen hodos, with Jesus. We'll start there next week, but what a, what a wonderful, I mean, the point of this healing is what? That we, what? Everybody can, can know this, right? And the irony is, the blind man is the one who saw it first. That is a beautiful. That is beautiful because that the Greeks would have seen that in, seen that immediately, right? The irony of this, the paradox, the irony is that a blind man is the guy who spotted and saw it, and Jesus did it, right? Healed him. Well, not just heal him. Spiritually, gave him what he wanted. Anyway, we'll start with this. This is a beautiful place to start. Thank you, Father, for your word. We pray you look after us this week. In your name we pray. Amen.